Welcome to Heritage Village. Um, my name is Heather Pelican. I'm the operations manager here, and thank you all so much for coming today on this Sunday afternoon. Today we'll have um, Lance Peterson and Michael Hirschap here from the Gulf Beaches Historical Museum down in Paso Grill, and they're going to be sharing with us a great history of the beaches, which is really fun. So um, thank you again for coming, and let's welcome both Lance and Michael. I'm going to go first. Um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? All right, first, we want to tell you that uh, we have a new book, so to speak. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was showing Wayne Ayers some columns that one of our early hoteliers had written, and Wayne decided that this would be an excellent project for us. So he has taken all of these columns and he's put an index and editorialized with them and he has put him in the book, and you all know Wayne, he's back here, he's gonna be signing books after the presentation, okay? And that is the book called Pioneer Days. It's about a guy who built the first hotel in Paso Grill in 1900, 1901, and literally lived through all this history. So this is a personalized account of how the islands grew. Now I'm going to start the program with Michael Hershop will do the first half, I will do the second. Thank you, Lance. First of all, how many of you actually grew, were born here and grew up here just out of curiosity? So, so about half a dozen, okay. How many of you lived here for 20 plus years? So most of the group then, okay. So I know Florida is a place where many of us moved. I moved here when I was a small kid and uh, I'm sure many of us moved here. So it's, it's kind of fun to discover the history of the, uh, of the place. The, um, as Lance was saying, we're with Gulf Beaches Historical Museum. Have most of you visit us down there in Paso Grill? Well, I encourage you to come down and visit us sometime. There's a brochure with the address and all that information for you to um, look at. And uh, we're down there um, right next to the Hurricane Restaurant, right across from there on the park there. So it's a pleasant place to visit. We're open during the season, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and during the non-season, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We're all volunteer operated. We come under Heritage Village. Um, they own our building, and the Friends of the Gulf Beaches actually operates the museum, so it's all volunteers. So if you're looking for volunteer opportunities, we're always looking for volunteers, so, so, uh, so if you're interested. Um, first of all, just kind of more of an introduction slide. Um, just kind of a little history about how we became a museum. The uh, building itself was the old actual church building down there. It was the Paso Grill Community Church. They built that around 1920, 1917. It's 100 years old this year. It's 100 years old this year, that's right, yeah. And um, the uh, building itself served as a church up to the late 1950s. At that time, they moved to their quote, quote, new building. And uh, which is up the road about 10 blocks, and um, the existing building was was bought by Joan um, Haley, who um, is photographist there. She had recently moved to the area. She was a um, uh, society writer for one of the Washington Evening newspapers. Her husband was a senior member of the Secret Service, so so they came down with that. And she was also a classic Virginia belle. So she loved to um, socialize, and uh, after her husband passed away shortly after they arrived here, she decided she did not want to live a long way away from where the action was. So she bought the building from the church, and she made it into her home, and she lived here for a long time, almost 30 years. And then on her death, um, she willed it to the county to be used as a historical museum. So that's kind of our, our finding, founding. And the building itself has withstood now two major hurricanes, so, uh, and uh, so we're glad for that. 
This is the area we basically cover. Um, Indian Rocks Museum, of course, covers, historical museum covers kind of north of here, but we cover the areas from the Reddington beaches southward, though most of our collection is on St. Pete Beach because Paso Grill, of course, is probably one of the oldest beach communities, not the oldest. Indian Rocks was settled about the same time as well. Now, the first settlers to the area, of course, and many of you guys know this history, so I won't go much in this, were the Temequan Indians, the Tokabaga, were the sub-tribe of the Tokabaga, who lived in the area, and of course, the Calusha in the south part of the Tampa Bay area. They were both mound builders, and we had quite a few mounds down in our area, as far as the, uh, the Indians, and uh, when, of course, um, the first um, um, Terra Verde Mound, there's a still a sign there, but that was actually one of the more unusual mounds. It was built right there where the, um, the road that goes down to Fort DeSoto. Um, when the Florida Department of Transportation were, was building the road, they encountered the mound and they gave the archaeologists from the University of Florida a weekend to, um, to basically do explorations and recover everything before they started back again. To, um, to build the road. So, uh, but they did find in this mound actually something, something unique in the sense that um, it was a true burial mound and the, um, all, the, all the different uh, people buried there were actually um, um, buried with their uh, feet pointing outward, um, basically like, like a sunshine, like rays of a sunshine pointing outward like that, which is highly unusual for, uh, for mounds from what I understand in North America. Now the first um, European to come to the area was of course the uh, Narrowes. He landed in what is now Park Street area, the jungle Pravda area, you probably know this. And he probably came up through um, what is now Terra Verde and Long Key, St. Pete Beach. And, um, and he landed there and, uh, in 1528. So very early on he landed there. And he started his explorations of the Tampa Bay area and eventually, um, as he and his party got lost, thinking Mexico was not a very far walk, they walked, they walked as far as the Gulf of California, uh, which is out by Calif which is, you know, out by California. It's a huge track you can kind of see in this southern slide. And uh, they eventually made, made it to Mexico City, but only with two of the party, 150. So only two or three survived. And one of them, which was the actual, the, person who wrote the um, narration of the trip. It's a fascinating adventure, actually. And uh, for those who like history, he, he's a fascinating individual. But uh, again, one of the earliest, only 30 years after Columbus, when you think about it. So uh, pretty early on, the Tampa Bay area was discovered by the Spanish. 1820s was when we started seeing some development in the area. That was when the uh, Florida became a US territory and eventually a US state. Um, the Tampa Bay area, of course, was, became, a, a major, became a major center because, of course, they established the fort in Tampa. As they, um, as they developed Tampa as a major um, center for bringing in, um, um, I guess, different sellers from the Carolinas, Georgia, um, you began to have some of the issues with the Seminoles, and of course, and that began the era of the Seminole Indian Wars. And uh, that was probably the next part of our history. For those of you who may not know it, Egmont Key served as a major deportation point for the Seminole Indians when they were being rounded up and shipped to Oklahoma and Arkansas territories. They were gathered up all over Florida and the bulk of the tribe was um, eventually shipped to, um, to the Indian territories and, uh, but only a small fraction of the tribe was able to survive in the, swamps and um, other areas in southern Florida. So um, again, that's kind of a tragic point of our history, but still um, um, part of the history nevertheless. So again, that was part of the um, Barry Islands of Pinellas County. Okay, during the 1850s and 1860s, the next part of our history, probably Civil War was the major element of that. The, um, um, you know, that pretty much brought a lot of um, economic grief to the area. Um, Florida, of course, was not in intimately involved in the Civil War as far as providing troops and things, but they were a major area where goods were smuggled into. So Egmont Key, Key West, other points like that served as federal hubs for enforcing the embargo or the uh, blockation of the coast of Florida. A lot of goods were being smuggled up from the Bahamas, from Cuba, so um, the, that became part of our history as far as smuggling and goods, which continues even to today. So, 
Egmont Key Lighthouse. Um, many of you have probably been down there. You probably don't realize that the engineer who actually helped design this and put, put the work into play was Robert E. Lee from Civil War fame. He was an engineer by profession. And uh, so he kind of designed the first lighthouse. The first lighthouse was built, and shortly thereafter, the great gale, the great storm of 19, 1848 came and heavily damaged that lighthouse. So they had to rebuild it again um, just two years later. So, uh, and during that storm, uh, there's uh, accounts of the lighthouse keeper having to tie himself to the highest palm tree to get from being washed away. And uh, so they had a huge tidal surge then of 15 to 20 feet. But if you guys haven't been down there, it's a wonderful place to go. And they usually have in the fall, they have uh, Egg My Key days where you can go down there and uh, visit. And they have a lot of uh, storytelling and, uh, and uh, and people who are actually playing the parts down there. So, now a little further on, um, during Robert Lee also had um, recommended in putting fortifications in down down there. And a little later on in the history of Florida, there was the issues of Spain down in Cuba. And and at that time, they decided that it was important to build the forts at Fort Dade and Fort DeSoto. Fort Dade was, of course, on Egmont Key, and Fort DeSoto was on what is Mullet Key or what is Fort DeSoto today. And both forts were built. They were never used for anything other than um, just, um, I guess they would do target practice and stuff, but uh, never used for actual defense. But uh, again, they're still around. The Fort Dade is not in near as good condition as Fort DeSoto is, but again, an interesting. Now, the first settlement of um, St. Pete Beach Pass and Grill was um, done by, um, you can see down here, um, the first settler's house was 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 built um, down here um, in, in, in 18 um, is it 86. 86 yeah and uh, by Zephediah Phillips um, his house was recently moved um, because of development and they put it behind a star uh, starfish restaurant so it's still there uh, it's been heavily changed over time but it still exists though and uh, the um, um, and his and when he built that, he got possession of most of what is now Southern St. Pete Beach as kind of a, a settlement. And uh, when he moved there, it took him three years um, to, to build his house. Um, his kids and his wife lived there in tents for that time period. And of course, when, he, when you talk about the history of, the time, of that time period, the whole place was nothing but mosquitoes, sand gnats. Um, you know, the water wasn't very good, and of course, you know, no power. It kind of, it's kind of like what we just experienced, I guess. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but, 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 he, but he survived, and, uh, and he did quite well. Um, later on, about 10, 15 years later, they built, or well, they moved in what is called the Floating Hotel, which was basically a barge. Um, it was there for a few, few years before it burnt, but it was the first hotel built on the, um, or I should say not built, but it was um, first hotel that ex existed on the beaches of Pinellas County. And then after that, of course, many more hotels were built. Paso Grill's golden days were in the 18, I mean, 1920, er, 1910s, 19, early 1920s. And uh, they had several major hotels that were built during that time period. Lazat, who uh, Lance referred to earlier, um, he was the first major hoteler here. He pretty much got St. Pete Beach going as a major hotel destination. He has a very interesting history. He was actually a student of the Sorbonne in Paris, France, studying theology. He joined a cook travel agency out of um, London and was a Nile River guide, and he became a pretty high-ranking um, member within that association of travel guides. And he was sent eventually here looking for possible tours here for the agency. He came here and he fell in love with the area, and uh, he decided to build a hotel. His first hotel um, was, um, was a very small, was basically a house that he converted over. It had only had a few rooms. It was basically a fishing lodge. And uh, he was famous for um, his marketing. He kind of got uh, um, barges coming out, not barges, but ferries coming over from Gulfport because there was, of course, no bridge built at the time. And uh, so he kind of got that tradition going. Um, Tampa people started coming here for, for day trips, actually. They would come to the beach. It's always much cooler on the beaches than in Tampa and inland because it's much hotter there. 
And you can see here he made the, sh the shore dinner, which was his classic thing, kind of a, you know, kind of fish dinner, which we still celebrate today. But he kind of had those. And, and some of his rooms, let me see if I have a slide of that. Um, well, he would, it, it was about, um, Lance, do you, how much was it a week now? It was only like $15 or something? $15 a week. Yeah, something like that, you know, for, for food and for lodging. So it was very reasonably priced, you know. But there was no, you know, there's a share in this, even in this bigger hotel, which, um, um, which will be the next slide. Um, you know, he had like 30 rooms, but only one bathroom. So you, you can get the feel, it's kind of plain. And of course he said that you can always go in the Gulf of Mexico to, to rinse off, you don't need a bathtub. Because you know? fresh water, of course, was still a major issue here. Yeah, this is the first bridge that was built. Mr. McAdoo, who, um, who was also very uh, involved in the um, development of the Gulf beaches, he's famous for naming Treasure Island. The, um, but um, he built this bridge over behind what it, where the Publix is in um, Pasadena, over to where the um, um, St. Petersburg um, Elementary School is now, the um, Gulf Beaches Elementary School. So, um, and, uh, so, so he built it up. It was a quarter to come over, which was pretty expensive at the time. No toll going back over. And um, so, um, so you can see even back then, there was lines of people ready to go over the bridge, actually, when he opened it. And uh, it was a pretty long bridge at the time. It was a pretty major construction project. And this was about, about the same time the Gandhi Bridge went in, too. So all of a sudden, the Gulf Beaches became accessible to a lot much larger population base. Yeah, this was the, um, another hotel that was built here. Uh, this was built by um, Fuller, who was uh, a mayor of St. Petersburg at one time. And you can see it's a pretty substantial hotel. Um, and um, he and McAdoo actually had um, some disagreements. Um, sometimes McAdoo would forget to, um, during the time it was required that uh, because navigation at a right away, you had to keep your bridges open. And sometimes he would forget that he had functions. And, uh, and so he would, he would open the bridge and go home. And, um, and several times uh, his um, guests who would come over for a big function the night got stuck on the island. And someone had to swim over, I guess, and open the bridge. And, uh, and so I know on one occasion, which I think he got seriously peeved, um, he actually um, decided next Sunday, which was the big day that um, that you would use a bridge for, he decided to sell his boat back and forth continually, so they never could close the bridge that day, or open the bridge that day. So, um, um, so and of course, they had qu quite a few words at that time, but, but both were very in instrumental in the development of the beaches and development of the bridges that would interconnect the, bridges, the beaches at one time or another. Now, this is an early picture of uh, Paso Grill Beach. You can see how much farther the beach used to exist at one time. You'll see pictures of this coming and going as far as the beach. Sometimes it's very wide, sometimes there's no beach at all. Kind of like today, I guess. It depends on erosion and different types of natural events. The uh, southern part of the island eventually became a, a naval, a army base, actually, during the Second World War. But you can see the, um, there's very little, and in the north of there, there's, none of the islands are developed. This bridge, this picture is probably from the 1930s, I think we figured. That's the last significant tropical event that happened here, the great hurricane of 1921. And you can see the uh, headline there is kind of like, even like today, like the Weather Channel was saying we we're going to get wiped off the face of the earth. Um, rumor, Paso Grill wiped out. And it proved to be, of course, not the case. So, uh, you know, I think I don't think anyone even died in, in Paso Grill during that event. There was um, a lot of um, property damage. You can see just some of the pictures there of the hotel I showed you earlier. But the structures back then were just made with wood. They weren't reinforced like today. So, uh, again, um, but but this started a chain of kind of events that actually le led to a lot of the hotels closing down. And uh, unfortunately, fire was a common occurrence back in the day, combination of e electrification and then um, the um, wires from the salt and people smoking and, uh, and candles and lanterns. Um, in the next three years, um, five of the major hotels burnt down, including this one, the big one there. And uh, so um, there's very little trace. Only a couple of the smaller hotels survived to this day. But you know, some hotels are pretty significant, though.
This, of course, the Don Desar was built in the 1927-28 time frame. It was built by a gentleman called Rowe. He, um, he came down here from up north. Um, he wanted to um, um, build a, a palace for his, um, I guess you could say, his, his, his lost love that he had when he was young. Um, it's kind of one of those classic love stories, actually. And, um, and he had met her um, in, when he did his great, um, back in the time, I guess, the young eligible man of money would go to Europe and do that grand tour. And uh, he met her on the London stage. She was um, in the, in the uh, opera called Martania, and uh, the title role of that was Don Cesar. And you'll find down in this area by the hotel down here, all the streets are named for characters from that opera. And, uh, and, but he fell in love with her, and they were going to run off and get married, um, kind of, you know, I guess kind of like Romeo and Juliet type thing. But um, it turned out that her parents found out about it, and she being from Spain um, and very Catholic, her family did not want her to marry a Protestant. So um, they whisked her away back to Spain, and he wrote to her for years and never got heard back. Eventually, her parents wrote back and said that she died early from a, some kind of a disease that was going through Spain at the time. And uh, so he kind of um, eventually married someone else, but his heart really wasn't in it. But he built this hotel, and actually there's a, there's a fountain just like the one they used to meet at in London, in a London stage. And they still say you can see their apparitions there, you know, in the, uh, in the hotel. So um, as far as he always wore a white, impeccable white suit, and uh, she always had a black dress on with even black hair. And you say, they say you can see them occasionally. I don't know. but. Um, this is what I hear. So um, I'm going to pass it on to Lance now, and he can uh, talk a little more recent history of Passive Grove since he kind of grew up during that time period. As Michael said, I grew up in the Passive Grove, Bella Vista area. Um, I actually went to church in what is now our museum as a kid, not very often, <laughs> but I did. and. Um, I've always wondered why nobody knew anything about our islands. So Michael and I, over the last couple of years, have, have kind of developed this thing, and it's a, it's a constantly changing program to keep us from getting bored. But uh, so I don't know, when you videotape it, you know, a year from now, it could be completely different, and you get another one. So uh, this is what they call the Old Spanish Fountain. Um, Paso Grill, for those of you who aren't aware of all of our legends and strange habits, back at uh, Boca Chica Bay, Tampa Bay, the shallow water bays of the west coast of Florida have always been a major fishing area for the Caribbean and basically most of the world. And the, the natives would come up here and they would fish and they would camp out on on what is now past the grill because we had the freshwater fountain. And let me tell you, freshwater was kind of a generous term. Uh, those of you who lived here back in the 50s and the 40s remember that old sulfur water we used to drink? That's what they called freshwater back then. It's sort of an acquired taste. So. Uh, because we had the, gr uh, the, the water, they would camp out on Pasha Grill and they would dry their fish, process their fish in fires around the point. And the fires were called grills. And ultimately, Pasha Grill Channel became known as the Pass of Grills, first in French, then in Spanish, and ultimately in English. And in 1905, when we got our post office and we told them we were going to name it Pasha Grill, they wanted to know why. And we said, well, we've always called it that. And they liked that, so we went on. This was called the Yacht and Anglers Club. Uh, Michael talked about the hotels. Everything was made of wood and everything burned. It was just kind of take that to the bank. But this thing started out as a hotel, but it became a bar, a club, where all the other hoteliers would give their, their visitors passes to this place, and they'd come in and get stinko, uh, you know, have a few beers, and tell stories. And it was a very popular place back in the 1920, and then it ultimately burned. And this was now where, I don't know if you all are familiar with Passa Grill, this is at the end of 10th Street, it used to be a hotel called the Passa Grill Hotel. And you can see from these cars, we're talking 1920s. It was there, and parking is always an issue. 
uh, has been since they invented cars and Paso Grill. This is uh, about where the hurricane is now. It's called Pages Pavilion. This is a July 4th, 1925 newspaper article complaining about no pack parking in Paso Grill. <laughs> they're parking in the alleys, they're parking on the lawns, they're, you know, it's in what we do today. This is a boardwalk, 10th Street all the way up the beach. I don't know anybody that's ever seen it. We've got about 20 pictures of it, so we know it was there. This is just another wooden hotel, and this is uh, Mud Key is now Vino Del Mar. You can see the hotel, the water tower, the Don up in the corner. And this is kind of from the Don going north. And just old pictures, these are all from the 20s. This is 8th Street, 6th Street, Magnolia, depending on whatever time you were here. Uh, according to Ripley's, believe it or not, it's the shortest Main Street in America. It still looks like this. Uh, in this one, you're looking east because you can see the Gulf of Mexico. In some of these, you can see land, so you're looking west. I mean, west and east, I got it backwards. This is east, this is west. But it looks like that still today. So, they used to uh, come over from Tampa by the thousands on the weekends, and they would rent bathing suits. And this is before polyester. I mean, we're talking wool. And they would rent these bathing suits out, and then they were finished with them, they would rinse them in cold water and wring them out, and they would rent them to the next person. Yeah, nobody died. You know, it was okay. Fishing. We had the greatest fishing in the world, bar none. When I was a kid, we gave grouper away. There was so much fish in the bay that and this is before air conditioning, so everybody had their windows open, everybody knew their, their neighbors and their neighbor's business. Uh, there was so much fish in the bay, people complained about the noise the fish made at night. You had schools of mullet coming into the bay that would take two days to transit into the bay. And of course, with the mullet was the sharks and the porpoise feeding on them. So you had the mullet jumping and the sharks and the porpoise feeding. And, it was just a, an interesting place to live. And of course, we thought that was how the whole world lived. It turned out it wasn't. But anyway, uh, tarpon was one of the big deals. You could catch them in the past. They caught them on rowboats. And you can understand if you had a rowboat and you hooked into a 100 pound tarpon, you're gonna be there a while. And they would tote you around the bay, you know, until he either broke the line or you wore him out and brought him in. But uh, we were the tarpon capital of the world. Now it's moved south down around Naples. Now this, uh, these are backroll and barracuda. And these are tarpon. And this lady, this kid with a bad look on her face has got a kingfish, but she's stuck behind these people and this fish, so she's probably not too happy. <laughs> but you will notice in all of these older pictures, these guys had on boots, long pants, long sleeves, and hats. They were a lot smarter about the sun than we were. When I was working the boats, it was shorts and t-shirts, and that was it. So, and of course, uh, half my generation should have skin cancer, but I never took a poll to see if they did or not. More tarpon, I mean, you just caught these things. It was, you couldn't not catch them. That's how, how much fishing we had going on. Uh, Babe Ruth, 1935, we also have a picture of him in 1924. He was here a lot. He fished a lot. Uh, this, see the long pants, hats, long sleeve shirts, tarpon, kingfish, barracuda, grouper, snapper. I figure this guy chartered the boat because he's got the tie on. <laughs> uh, but we did. We were a, a blue collar fishing village when I was a kid and it was a really great place to live. Uh, this is our fish fry. Uh, a couple years ago, we had the 86th annual, so we're getting into it. Kenny Mary, who had the, his family was here in 1900, and they have been with the fish fry from day one. This is his son, who was killed in Vietnam, so that'll give you an idea how old this picture is. Uh, I probably know all these kids at some point. And the fish was cooked on a mattress, a uh, bed springs, and they still do it that way. I don't do it that way. I don't go to the fish fry. When is it? When is it? I'm sorry? When is the fish fry? It'll, it's in the fall. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get some inf information out on it. It'll be the, like the 90th or so, you know. In fact, we might have two because we have competing schools now. It's gotten really weird. 
Um, this is a 1950, they're saying 1950. I'm thinking it's a little earlier. This is the Paso Grill Hotel. Look how wide the beach is here. There are no seawalls. Uh, this guy, when I was a kid, had a dock with a, with a gas pump on it. That's why I'm saying this picture's older. Uh, the church or the museum is right here. This is again on 8th Street. This was uh, one of the sundry stores. But that's just, uh, you can see how it was just streets and trees and sand and fishnets everywhere. Uh, looking north up to Blind Pass, uh, you'll notice no houses, Gulf Boulevard is two lanes. Um, it's just, uh, this is about 1950, about the time we got there. Uh, this is uh, World War II. The Don, as you know, was turned into a, a um, army rehab hospital. And they basically serviced people who were flying aircraft out of Italy and bombing Eastern Europe and they would get shot down, and if they weren't captured by the Nazis, they were smuggled back to Switzerland, and I mean they were like traveled at night, hid during the daytime, and they got back to Switzerland, they'd be repatriated, and they'd be brought over to the Don, and some of these guys went back to the combat, and some of these guys didn't. Uh, Joe DiMaggio came through here, Cary Grant came through here. Um, you could see that while they were in their rehab, they were doing things, People, this is the museum, this, when it was a church. Uh, all these little air fields around here, Peter O'Knight, Albert Witter, these were all army fighter bases, and they would practice bombing our islands. We have a, a guy that comes and talks to us from Indian Rocks, uh, who used to, as a kid, and would be in Indian Rocks this summer, he got caught in one of their strafing things, he talks about that, and when they discovered that they had kids there, and they're going, stop the plane, stop the, you know, that kind of stuff. This uh, was just a couple of years ago, they found an, a, a live bomb on Paso Grill, and they detonated it, that's the Don in the background. And these are some of our local uh, bathing beauties. Uh, we've always uh, done well with that part of it. Uh, there's another Babe Ruth. This is baseball. Um, New York Yankees from God knows when, 1945 maybe. This is what they used to play down at uh, what is now Bayfront Stadium or Waterfront. More Yankees, Joe at Maryland. Uh, Joe was here as, with the Yankees when he, after he was here with uh, the Army. And they honeymooned at the Tides. And she was here a lot when they were married, Maryland, for those of you who haven't figured that out. Uh, when she was here, every camera in Pinellas County was with her. <laughs> and she liked it, and they liked it, so it worked out fine. Uh, Babe Ruth, this is the 1924 picture of him. He got into a real estate scam in the middle 20s that had to do with um, property that didn't exist out around Mirror Lake. Now, you, I know you're shocked that we in Florida would do something like that. <laughs> uh, and these are just uh, guys fishing. Uh, this is Silas Dent. One of, uh, one of our hermits, and we'll talk about him in a minute, and I don't know who this guy is, what I do, but I don't know his, remember his name. Uh, hmm? Lazat. Oh, is that Lazat? Yeah. No, you're right. That's a pretty old picture of him, isn't it? Yeah. There we are, Silas Dent. Uh, he and his family came up here from Douglasville, Georgia, about 1900. They settled on Cabbage Key, where that Indian mound is, uh, just out by Fort DeSoto and they had a dairy farm. And they had an old Cadillac. Now, this is where Frank Hurley kind of takes some license with things, but we're talking 1916, 1917, and he's talking about an old Cadillac, and I really don't know what he means by that. But anyway, they would fill these cans up with milk, and they would put them in this Cadillac, and they put the Cadillac on a barge, and they'd bring it over to Pass a Grill, and there was a, a shell road that ran from Blind Pass all the way to Pass the Grill, and they would drive up and down this road and sell milk. And then at some point they moved, the family moved to Bella Vista and reopened the dairy there, but he stayed up on Cabbage Key, and these are a couple of his cows, I guess, calves, and he played Santa Claus for the kids, and he's listed among the early banjo pickers. He was what I call the world's worst hermit. He was over in Paso Grill more than he was over in Cabbage Key, but that was okay. He was kind of a nice guy. And this is my cross-the-street neighbor, a retired 
uh, St. Pete Fireman who plays Silas Dent for us when we have events. And I, I like to tell the story, the first time we had him playing Silas Dent, he was sitting in a rocker on the porch of the museum. And these two ladies were coming up the sidewalk, both of whom grew up in Paso Girl, and both of whom knew Silas Dent personally. And one said, gee, it looks just like him. And the other one at the exact same time said, doesn't look anything like him. <laughs> so that's kind of where you go with these things. Sunshine School, little six-room elementary school in Paso Grill, got written up in national magazines. It's just one of our best exhibits in the museum. People come in and they find themselves and they, they sing the school song and, and uh, it's just a, a great exhibit for us. They would take classes on the beach and they would learn fishing and they would learn swimming and they learned things that most kids didn't learn in school. And uh, all these pictures, these kids are just shining and clean. And I used to say, because I knew them, I grew up with them, and I'd say, how come you guys are so clean? And they took the pictures at 7 o'clock in the morning <laughs> before the kids got underway. My favorite slide. This, uh, start down here, this is a, a grocery store on 8th Street. And it was part of what they called the frog stores. Those were Florida retail-owned grocers. And this was a consortium of small grocery stores that got together so that they could buy in bulk and compete with the Winn-Dixie, who was the big dog at the time. They could compete price-wise with them. So this guy was part of that. Uh, this is the Seahorse, which is on 8th Street across from the fishing pier. I'm thinking that this may be the oldest continuous restaurant in Pinellas County that has never changed its name and never closed the doors. Now, a friend of mine whose dad owned the big hotel when we were kids in Paso Grill told me that his dad bought this in 1938 and he was the second owner. So we know that this is uh, going on. I don't know of another restaurant in this area that has this kind of history. This is the Casa Bonita and it sits now where the hurricane sits and its only distinction, and the only reason it's in this slideshow, is this is where me and my friends first drank illegally. <laughs> now, these were the boats at the fishing pier. This is the all-day boat, the Miss Pass the Grill 3. For, for five bucks, you got an all-day fishing, you got a pole, you got bait. We would bait your hook for you, we would take the fish off the hook for you, and we guaranteed a fish. If you didn't catch a fish, you got to go again, and we gave away very few passes. This is the boat I worked on most. This is the half-day boat. For 350, you got the same deal except no free pass, but we, we could have given it out. We caught a lot of fish, and we went out twice a day. And down, down here you have, this is the um, Lucky Strike, and that was Captain Bobby Buswell, Golf Pride, Captain Buster Herzog, and then over here behind that, was the um, Yellowtail, and that was Captain Joe, Divers Joe, Joe Dvorsak. And about 10 years ago, I got the three of them together up here at Heritage Village with Captain Bill Miller, and we had a almost two-hour oral history where the three of them sat around and talked about fishing in the 50s and the 40s, and you know the changes that came along, like monofilament line, like fiberglass poles, uh, fish hooks without barbs because uh, our customers kept stabbing themselves and we could never get the damn hook out. So uh, we, I've still got the CD of that. It is a great thing. And I was fortunate enough to know these people and work with them when I was a kid. They went on to become legends. So that's why this is my favorite slide. This is just the fire department. This was our volunteer fire company and jail right here. This was on uh, 9th Street facing the bay. This is just Paso Grill Beach, and you can see how wide it is. The trees aren't even in the picture. That's how wide it is. Another shot of 8th Street looking east. There's a uh, pine key in the background. This is about, what, 1946 Chrysler? And people fishing off of docks, which is kind of what we do there. And this is um, Blind Pass again, about 1950. And you notice they're just starting to build houses. There's still some roads in. Blind, uh, Golf Boulevard is still two lane. Blind Pass has been trying to close up for the last, I don't know, probably 100 years, and we've been digging it open, but sooner or later, it, it's gonna close. And that's gonna really raise heck with these beaches around here. But this is uh, downtown in Paso Grill. 
Let's see, we'll start over here. This is the Aquatarium. Uh, it's uh, a condo now, you'll be surprised to learn. It, uh, it w was open for about 10 years or 12 years. I attended bar when I was going to University of South Florida. I was living on St. Pete Beach and commuting to Tampa every day. And the guy that had the seal exhibit would bring his seals into the bar. And they would sit on the bar stools. And, you know, and all the drinkers were like, hey, look what we got here. But the seals didn't want to be handled. So if you reached out to pet one, they would grab you. They wouldn't hurt you, but they just didn't want to be handled. And they'd be there about 20 minutes, and he'd go, all right, guys, let's go. And they'd get down off the stools, and they'd go on out. And they did this about once a week. It was kind of fun. Um, this is the Beach Theater. It's still there. Uh, the owner died a couple of years ago unexpectedly. And the family apparently is having uh, difficulty agreeing on what to do with this building. We're hoping that they keep it. it. You know, I've been going to movies there since I was a kid. But I don't know. I simply don't know what's going on. The Wax Museum is now Silas Dent's Steakhouse. This is up on 55th across from the Trade Winds. Uh, this is, again, about the same life expectancy as the Aquatarium, about 12 or 15 years. It was, it was actually quite interesting. And uh, this more Florida. This is the Sun um, Pelican Diner. This was a 24-hour diner on 75th and Gulf Boulevard where after we took our dates home at night, we'd go there and all the musicians who were playing along the beaches would go in for coffee afterwards. And this, it was a great place to, to see people and spend like three o'clock in the morning if you had nothing else to do. This thing is still there. It was there when I was a kid, this uh, ice cream place, and it's still packed. And this is this Cory Avenue with a uh, Studebaker and a, I don't know, a Buick, I guess, or a Dodge or something, one of those. And this is the first day of Sunshine Skyway, 1952. I think it was Labor Day. Every car in this picture is a Dodge convertible. <laughs> they must have emptied out every Dodge dealer in the state of Florida to get this. Uh, this is the original bridge, these two pictures. And this is what the bridge replaced. And this is ferries that, that uh, serviced Tampa, St. Pete, Gulfport, Pasigrel, Bradenton, and Sarasota, and different ways they would go. But they talk about bringing this stuff back. I'd like to see it personally, but I'm in no hurry anymore. So, you know, uh, that was a, uh, the, the ferries were fun, but the bridge is always, it cut the, the trip to, to uh, Sarasota hours because you had to go all the way around Tampa and plants you know Palo Beach and all that stuff uh, we're getting into Treasure Island uh, this all my life people have been fishing off bridges and I we came home from the football game the South Florida football game the other night 1030 and I dropped Michael off at his house and sure enough there's guys fishing on the bridge they're always there uh, this goes over to uh, Fort to uh, this is the Madeira Beach one right Madeira Beach, Treasure Island. This is the original uh, Treasure Island Causeway, which I've always thought was one of the prettier ones around. And this is just a, uh, an ice cream and beer shack on the beach. This is something that, um, I was down at the uh, Museum of South Florida in Bradenton, and I, I was looking through a book on Miccosukee Indians, which is basically the Seminoles. And I ran across this thing called the Blind Pass Seminole Village. And I had never heard of this. This is in no history books that I know of. I talked to Jim Schnur about this about a year ago, and he, he knew about it. But I said, Jim, why isn't it in any books? He says, I don't know. People just don't think it's important. I think this is quintessential Florida. Some guy talked a bunch of Indians into to building an Indian village on Treasure Island on the Blind, pa at Blind Pass on the Bay Side, and we're talking 1928, 1929. And at that time, the only way you could access this place is by boat, so people would get on a sightseeing boat and come over and watch these Indians be Indians. You know, I, I find that to, you know, think about it. They get up in the morning and they get, who gets to wear the bright shirt, you know? Who's going to do the cooking today? I mean, what do we do? Because these, these guys are going to come over and look at us. Now, down in the Miami area, they fought alligators. You know, they actually did something. But here, who knows? 
So anyway, this thing was, went on for about two years, six months at a time, and the Florida Senate got concerned that somebody was using the Seminole Indians for personal gain. Can you imagine? In Florida? So they made it a misdemeanor to do this. I don't think the law was ever prosecuted for anybody. Uh, these people, after about two years, said to hell with this, and they went home. So, but this is something that should be in the history books, and it's not, and it's our history. Uh, the Thunderbird, when I was uh, in a kid, at uh, one time I worked for a marine construction company and we set foundation pilings for an addition to the Thunderbird. It's been here since the 40s. Uh, over here is Treasure Island, and when, when he talks about Mr. McAdoo naming Treasure Island, the story goes that he had a lot of property on this island, and he hired some people to dress up like pirates and pretend to find a sunken treasure. And this got a big splash down in the St. Pete Times and all of that. And the end result was he got to name the island. We don't know if he sold any land, but it's been called Treasure Island ever since. Uh, again, the Treasure Island Causeway. These are some of the old uh, Art Deco hotels. This on this side, this is island, this is all man-made. This is island, this is all man-made. And we're getting into that kind of stuff here. This is a, a relatively recent addition. The people that own uh, Middle Grounds I went to high school with, I was talking to them one night and I needed some more stuff for Treasure Island. And so they gave me these uh, Robbie's Pancake House, which is one of the well-known pancake houses on the west coast of Florida, 1973 to 2005. In 2005, they took it down and they put up the Middle Grounds. It's a steakhouse, it's quite nice, but it's not like Robbie's. And uh, so this is kind of a before and after picture. We're getting into John's Pass. Uh, this was a, um, Mr. Hurlbert owned this. He had a porpoise over here in this, uh, it, was, it was a small aquatarium. Kids I knew would go swimming with the porpoise. They were, they all seemed to get a kick out of it. This is, uh, by the way, Madeira Beach was also called Mitchell Beach at one time. Part of Madeira Beach is called Seminole Beach at one time. Um, it went back and forth and back and forth, and I, again, talked to Jim Schnur about that, and he told me that somewhere around 1900, 1910, a family named Archibald owned most of the island, and they wanted to have a name, and his wife insisted on having a name that had IRA in it. So they scanned the atlases of the whole world, and the only thing they could find was the Madeira Islands off of Spain, M-A-D-E-I-R-A, -E and that's how it got named. Uh, kind of interesting. Uh, again, you've got the, the standard Florida stuff, swimmers, houses, development, all what we do best. John's Pass, I've always uh, thought of, of uh, Madeira Beach as kind of a strip mall city. You know, as you went down to Gulf Boulevard, it was this, then it was this. This is Church by the Sea. They, they're, they're, they've really fixed it up now. It looks a lot nicer. They've gotten away from this kind of stuff. But um, this is the uh, bridge going over to uh, Treasure Island. This is the John Stewart Causeway. I'm not sure what these are. This is, like I say, the Church by the Sea and some of the early strip malls. That's working our way up to the Reddingtons. So the Reddingtons were named by Charles Reddington back in, right after World War II. He discovered that in Florida, if you have 10 people in a, in a kind of a defined area, you could incorporate. And when you incorporate, of course, that means taxes and laws and rules and protection and stuff like that. So I guess if it was good for Reddington Beach, it was also good for Reddington Shores and North Reddington. And you know, these are all little communities. Um, this is the only pier I know of that goes out into the Gulf of Mexico, all on this, on this set of islands anyway. Uh, at one time it was called the Dubai Pier. It seems that the people that owned the pier got crosswise with the local government about something and changed the name from Reddington Pier to Dubai. And it's Reddington again. I noticed the other day when we went by it, but who knows. 
Uh, this is uh, going west along a, a, a causeway, and you've got a storm, you've got a threatening storm, you've got sunshine. I just like that picture. Uh, this is called uh, netting fish, and what they're talking about here is mullet fishing. You go out in rowboats, and, and you have a main boat, and you've got all your nets, and the idea is to find a school of mullet, and you circle them with the nets, and if you're lucky, you can pull them up into the boat. But if you could beach them, it was a lot better. So we used to try to beach them where we could. And of course, you always have people on the beach. And when you put your nets on the beach, you got people in your nets. You know, you're trying to get everything that's not a mullet out of your net. They're in there picking up things and they're looking around and they're having a wonderful time. And then by the time you get to the fish house, the fish are old. So they finally made it illegal for us to do that, but it was, it was what we did for a while. Um, we're going to talk about development. Over 45% of Boca Ciega Bay has been filled in and land has been created. In the process, over 100,000 over 100, acres of seagrass has been destroyed. And in the seagrass was the beginning of the food chain. And when the food left, the fish left. And it was almost overnight that we went from having the greatest fishing in the world to whatever's going on out there today. Like I said, we gave grouper away when I was a kid. Now you go 100 miles offshore to get it and pay $20 a pound for the same fish. All this white is uh, dredging and filling. This would be Vina del Mar. This is the northern end of Tierra Verde. Uh, this is down around Treasure Island. Um, the regular island is right here. So this is the, the new Bayway Bridge. This is the original Bayway Bridge as it was being constructed. This is called Isla. You've got uh, Pastor Grill out here. I think I'm doing this right. Fort DeSoto would be down here. This is all man-made, this whole thing. And this is the little fella that does all the work. This is called a dredge. You take these posts and you anchor them down in the bottom of the bay and then you start pumping, and you pump until you either have worn out the bay or you've got enough sand or whatever. Exactly the same process as they use for renourishing beaches. They take the water off the bottom of the gulf or the bottom of the bay, and they build land with it. We started this part when we did the talk for the 60th anniversary of St. Pete Beach, which was a month ago, a couple months ago. And what happened was, when I was a kid, Pasigrill was its own city with a fire department and a policeman, volunteer fire company. Don Cesar was an incorporated city. Bella Vista, this was county area. And then St. Petersburg Beach was up here at the north. Now, in the 50s, they decided to modernize us, and that meant bringing in sewer lines and water lines and stuff like that. I guess they got tired of us using a bay. So what you ran into was five governments and nobody wanted the same thing, and nobody could afford any of this stuff. So you've got people who want, we want blue ones, we want red ones, we want ours over here, we want ours over here. So the companies that were doing the work, they backed away and they said, you folks need to figure it out. You know, speak with one voice, however you do that. But you know, we're not gonna deal with all you different people, it just can't work. So we did what we always do, we had a fight. And uh, this is the vote yeses, and this is the vote noes, you know. This is a little Russian village, and on and on. And one of the few things that penetrated my teenage years was this particular fight. So on July 9th, we voted. And the results of the vote, the, the mayor of Bella Vista, a guy named Leland Johnson, counted the votes. The yeses won by one vote. Well, they said, that's too close. <laughs> But rather than re-vote, they recounted. And it turns out that we in Paso Real don't count so good. And the final was five votes, and they decided that was enough of a margin, and we were one city. And that city was called the Long Beach Sewer District. So nobody thought that was a great name for a tourist destination. So we had this other fight, and it came down to St. Petersburg Beach or Paso Grill. And St. Petersburg Beach won by the same five votes, and these people have never forgiven these people. To this day, there's hostility and animosity between the two ends of the island. 
<laughs> and the people in the middle just watch and wonder what the heck's going on. But that's how we do things on the beaches. We're going to talk about change. Uh, what can happen in a 10 year period? And let's get this going. In 1955, I'm 15 years old. I'm a sophomore at Boca Ciega High School. 1965, Spencer, who is our president of our museum, and his great grandfather was Warren Webster, who donated the public beach to Paso Grill so it'll never be built on and things like that. So he's got a long history. But anyway, it was convenient that he's the age he is. He's 15, he's living in Paso Grill, and he's going to Lakewood High School. When I was a kid, Paso Grill was its own city. By 1965, we're all part of St. Pete Beach. Segregation, this was not a big deal. Uh, on the island, we had the blacks out there, they worked, they did this and that, but if you wanted to see the different bathrooms and the drinking fountains and that, you had to go downtown St. Petersburg. Uh, we didn't have it on the islands. So segregation really didn't have much to do with this. This is the big one. Once they made it possible for the beautiful people to live out there, it was all over for the rest of us. Uh, as I say, lots of fishing families, they're all gone. Best fishing in the world, it's gone. No Bayway, well, we got one now. No Tierra Verde, same deal. Gulf Boulevard was two lane and I tell people on a Sunday, remember Sunday drivers? They would, the traffic jam would start in Pasadena and it would come onto Gulf Boulevard, two lanes, all the way to Pass the Grill, around the point, down to 22nd, back out, back on Golf Boulevard, and back out to Pasadena. There would be solid cars, and this would go on all day. So if you were living in Paso Grill and you wanted to go down the beach, you planned on about a two-hour trip. And I mean, we're doing that today with four lanes, but this was just incredible. That a solid, they didn't get out of their cars or anything, they just drove. It was an amazing thing. So Golf Boulevard is four lanes. Boca Sega was a brand new school when I went there. Lakewood was a new school for Spencer. One hotel, the Don Cesar, now we've got hotels everywhere. We, post office closed in 2010. Uh, this is one of the local uh, activists and myself. We've got this thing, we've got this hanging out in front of the museum now with a sign on it saying, you know, this is from the post office and people come in and want to buy stamps. <laughs> they want to mail packages and on and on. This is the original uh, settler's cottage that's being moved down behind a seahorse. It took some a hit during the tornado about five or six years ago. And the guy in the seahorse paid a buck for it and I think he's turning it into a condo, but it is the original settler's cottage. Or what they're saying is there's enough original wood left for it to be historical. I'm pretty sure I don't know what the, all that means. Another old picture of Passa Grill the water towers, this is the old hotel that burned in 1967. This is Vina Del Mar when it was called Mud Key, the Don, just an old picture of, of the place. That's today's skyline basically, the Don and all these others buildings. When I was a kid and you're out on, in the Gulf, the only thing on the horizon was the Don. So if you want to go home, you just aim for it. Now you got all this other stuff out there and you don't know where to go sometimes. I don't. These are some reasons why we still live here. The top right is an osprey bringing food back to the kids. Top left is a wood stork. These folks came up from the Everglades about 10 years ago and I was told they would never survive. This is a really fragile bird, blah, blah, blah. Well, they're doing fine. At least I, up to the hurricane, they're doing fine. I don't know what they're doing now. I haven't seen one in the last couple of weeks. But they're, they're, they're a pretty magnificent bird to see in the air. This is a, a roseate spoonbill. I'd never seen one flying. Pretty cool little bird. And this, of course, is an egret or a heron. You notice how he flies with his neck curled and all the rest of them are stretched out. I'm not sure what that means either, but it's kind of fun. So George Lazat, our first hotelier, claims to have written this. I always thought it was Ogden Nash, but I can change. A gorgeous bird is the pelican whose beak holds more than his belly can. He can put on his beak food enough for a week, but I don't see how in the hell he can. <laughs> and this is kind of what we do best around here. And this is the end of the show, folks. <laughs>